TVV. Welcome everybody, my name is Leon van Roy and this is quite a special night for me tonight. First, because John Averis, I'm going to talk with John Averis, which is a big honor for me. It's a friend of the family, of the friend of the family and the festival, so I'm really eager to see him again. And it's our first edition of Playgrounds in Depth. So we're starting out with our own channel and we're going to give you as much as possible rich content on everything that's happening creatively. So uh, I really want to welcome John. Hello, John. Welcome Leon, at my how table. are you? I, well, I'm, thank I'm you so much for welcoming me back. Yeah, of course. We I wish you would live in the Netherlands, to be honest, John, and you can have like coffee every day, but unfortunately, yeah. Corona, so we have to wait till you can join us again. But we do it on a virtual way, so in a way, you're, I have the feeling you're on my table now, and I'm uh, really, really, yeah, eager to ask you like a lot of questions uh, because a lot of people they are enjoying your work very much and we want to know everything about it so we can learn uh, as much as possible so uh, yeah well first of all I'm, I'm going to start with like some nice sketches from references I, I'm showing now like a real model um, where does your love for art came from John my love for art I I guess when I was a kid, I was kind of grew up in an, in an art family. My mom used to love to draw. I remember when she was, when we were like five years old in our apartment, she had a lot of Japanese tapestries. Like um, she had um, paintings that she would put in the room that she did when she was in college and so forth. So um, it was stuff that she drew and painted. And that was, I saw that and I'm like, wow, that's, you know, I, that was my expo my first exposure. And then I had uncles who drew, not professionally, but they would like just draw for fun. And uh, and then my my biological dad, I say my biological dad because uh, uh, we were separated when we were young. But from what I remember, about five years old, he used to draw horses and draw other things. So I think family-wise, that was my first exposure. Just you know, people who drew in the family. So but uh, no one really, no one drew professionally. They just they just drew for fun or as a hobby. And how then slowly did you go to art academy? What was your steps then uh, becoming slowly professionally? I took the long way. I went to school um, after high school. I went to uh, university, U UC Santa Barbara, um, as a math major. But then um, I did that because I thought math was safe. And then after two years, I got kicked out of school. And, um, and then I went back home and took odd jobs. And uh, you know, I was really depressed. So I went to a junior college and I took life drawing classes at night to cheer myself up. And I did that for like three years, uh, did odd jobs on the side to help pay rent for my mom and dad. And then I had enough credits to go back to UC Santa Barbara and then I was an art major. And then uh, about three years after that, I graduated when I was 25 with a studio art degree. So uh, that, that, I took the long way and that's how I got into, I guess, you know, uh, getting more training as far as art. And what, what, was your, what was your goal when you did like this art, art trainings? What was, what was the goal? What were you aiming for? Or did well, you just the, like art or did you have a plan uh, with this? At, at the time, I just liked art because I thought, okay, I'm going to do something I like or something I enjoy. So I just did art. And at the time, the program at UC Santa Barbara was a studio arts degree. And that's more or less a fine arts degree. So we did a little bit of sculpture, painting, uh, ceramics, printmaking, that, that type of thing. And I was leaning more on the, on the painting and, and drawing side. So when I got out, um, I didn't really have any, any kind of like really specific training as far as animation. So I had a lot of like life drawing and gesture drawing. So a, a lot of my portfolio was that. So after I graduated, I was like looking for a job, but I didn't really find any, anything uh, because it really wasn't, I mean, Maybe it was it was on my part. I looked in the wrong places to look for jobs, but there really wasn't anything kind of screaming out that they needed like artists who had fine art degree background. So it was around that time. I think it was like a year or two afterwards uh, that animation was starting to make it seen. So that's when I'm like, huh, maybe I should try animation. So I remember the first thing I did was a Rugrats storyboard test, and uh, by Klaus Kishupo. That was the first uh, thing that I can recall where it was a test that I 
was trying to do to get into animation. I had no idea what I was doing. I totally bombed, but um, that, that, I'm, that, that was right. I think I was like 27 when I started doing that. 27. Yeah. Hey, and I'm now showing like a lot of um, drawings from references. So when sitting in the mm -hmm. park, uh, mm -hmm. That's also what you did back then a lot. Are you drawing like a lot from references in public space? Back, I can't, well, are you asking like uh, back then when I was, uh, uh, no, when I was yeah, graduating? Yeah, back then, also back then. Yeah, I would just kind of just draw whoever. I remember I'd go to, the, uh, they didn't have Starbucks back then. I would go to like uh, the bookstore and I would, uh, they had a coffee shop and I would like draw people as they come in and out and then, um, I remember there, um, I would go into a bookstore. This was when Jurassic Park was coming out. I remember uh, there was an art of Jurassic Park and I was looking at the book and that was one of the first early things I saw of uh, storyboards. So I was like, oh, composition, you know, uh, that's what the, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was trying to like figure it out on my own. And then I would try and do a lot of that, like little thumbnail sketches back then. Uh, I remember at, at the local uh, bookstore. I would do that, and maybe there was a coffee shop that I would go to, and I would do that as well. Uh, it was more like I was trying to uh, do little compositions or at least life studies on people drawing, or I would read a book, and I would try and figure out like a, like a scene. But it was very crude and rude. I had no idea what I was doing, but that was kind of, I recall trying to, trying to, trying to figure, that, figure that out back then. So yeah, it was, it was bad. <laughs> Yeah, because I was like quite intrigued by this drawing that I saw, this little girl uh, who is like uh -huh. sorting things out, like laying on the floor, and she was like, she's really grabbing for something. And, and then I thought, well, it also told me like how you approach character design, that like with mm. a few strokes, that I, that I, that's what I thought. Like when you're looking around in public space, you try to mm -hmm. think what kind of person it is, right, in the way they move, yeah. in the way they look around. So even you see in a coffee shop, for example, if somebody is like yeah. reading the paper or how they manage their coffee cup, it tells a lot about the character. Uh, and I saw yeah. a drawing of the girl that was like walking and then I stumbled upon you, sent me like such an incredible uh, collection of really nice artwork. I was like overwhelmed by this tsunami of great work. But then I, I stumbled upon this little drawing of, of this girl, uh -huh. and just with a few lines, it, it, it tells so much about actually the design, but also about the character. Mm. When you do character design, like, where are you focusing on? What do you try to, to bring into that person or that, in that design? Yeah, it's, uh, I should clarify the sketches of the little girl kind of like on the floor. Uh, kind of rerun. That was my daughter. That was kind of recent. When I say recent, it was like six years ago. And yeah, I would do a lot of that where I would just kind of sketch, uh, I would sketch my daughter or if there was a pet or a cat or just at the coffee shop at Starbucks, I would draw people like ordering coffee. But yeah, for these, these were just kind of like, uh, you know, I, it's funny, I should clarify, I'm not a character design artist. I've done a little bit of character design, but um, I'm mostly used as a, like a set designer. But I like to do character designs just on my own, uh, my own work, like, you know, my own projects, my own stories. And when I approach it, I always approach it like I'm just kind of like, uh, I'm just trying to find the design, but more or less, I'm actually just trying to find emotions or having them act. And I always like to work in the most simplest, like, forms or constructions. So a lot of things are just very simple based on um, a simple shape. So for this this little girl, I was kind of basing it off my daughter. Uh, so, uh, at the time, she was like uh, 11 or 12, and um, I was trying to figure out like uh, like maybe, maybe if it was a girl, how would she react? And I remember my girl was she had, you know my little girl would would be uh, uh, she would go through different feelings and so forth, and I was just trying to mimic her at the time. Uh, so a lot of it, I was telling my daughter, but I was also trying to create a little girl who had this like vivid imagination who. Uh, was very outspoken and, you know, out loud with her emotions and gestures. So I was like approaching more of her emotions. And, you know, I was at the same time, I'm trying to figure out her design. And, you know, things aren't really on model, but a, a lot of times I'm just trying to find a, an actor. I'm trying to find the actor before, maybe before I find the design. And then I go back and I, then I try and make the design consistent. 
but that's later. Right now, I'm just trying to like, oh, how would she? How would she talk? How would she yell? You know, is she sneering? Is she? Is she sad? I'm kind of, you know, loosely trying to figure that out. But you, but you mentioned that you are like, not really a character designer. Did you read? Really just told me that, that you're not like really a character designer in that sense, because I saw so many great character designs that I, I can't believe you're considering yourself like that. This is like, um, this is not only your personal projects, this is like a humongous amount of character designs and really great ones. So is there like a passion for this? What character design still, if you, even though you mentioned yourself that you are more like asked for set design? Yeah, I mean, most studios use me as a set designer or or a visual development artist where I kind of use, you know, I put characters in a story moment with the location. But um, at first I wanted to be a character designer and uh, I was doing a lot of characters. And then what happened was, I guess, as I got into the industry, I got greedy and I'm like, I don't want to share my character designs. I want to just, you know, do it for me. The, the, you know, I realized like when you do a character design or when you character designs for studios, they own it. You know, they, they have it, they, you know, it's for their means. And, you know, contractually, it's like, I can't do anything with it because I'm doing all this work for them. So, and for, as a personal thing for me, I just kind of like, no, I'm just going to do it, all my characters for me. So that's why I kind of like, no, I'm just going to, if I'm going to do something for studios, I'd rather do storyboarding or set design. That way I'm happy, you know, I can give up, I, I don't mind giving away a building or, or drawing locations for, for folks. I think the characters, you know, they're more specific to, to, um, to these, the, you know, they have personalities and so forth. So that's why uh, I'm honored when I'm asked to be a character designer or do character design, but I'd rather just save them for my own. But that's right. a personal thing for me. Yeah. But I'm, I'm flattered when, when people, when I'm asked, because I, um, you know, I, I, early on, I really wanted to be a character designer, but I had no idea or formal training how to go about it. I just kind of, you know, I fudged with it until I was, you know, got some lucky responses. I got so many drawings that I consider, if I was wondering myself, like how many hours a day do you actually draw? Because I think you even draw when you're underneath the shower or like... <laughs> It's, it's like such a load of work. And if this, all of what I'm just showing, like all the character designs, et cetera, they are like a lot also just for yourself, then I can imagine there's like quite hard to, to stop or any, in a way, or, or am yeah, I totally I, wrong? You just do six no, hours a day and then you go to park. No, I'm, I'm lucky where I love to draw. I, I, I draw to relax. I mean, I draw for work. And then when I'm not working, I draw for fun. And then when I'm not doing that, I'm doing a lot of teaching on the side, and I do drawers. So I love to draw. So for me, it's not really work. I just love doing it. And that's why I always say I, I'm, I'm very lucky when I get paid for it. So I just I love to draw. And I'm, I, I love to try and learn different things as I draw. And I, you know, every night I go on social media, and I always discover new artists, you know, young, young artists from different places. And I'm like, wow, that is awesome, you know, their take on a certain thing or – or then I always like to go back and when I do research, I look at older artists. Not when I say older artists, it's like older masters, uh, artists I never heard of before uh, from different countries and different time zones or, or different periods. And I just kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm a student again. I'm going back and I'm learning what their technique is and, and how, they, how they compose. So I'm always kind of, I'm always excited about that. I'm always, you know, I, I love drawing and, and, and I'm always trying to like staying inspired and trying to, just like, you know, um, I think what we all do, we're all trying to see like what people do and like, oh, how do they do that and stuff. So I, I'm just excited by, by just drawing, you know, so. Hey, and when you do character design, because I'm now like, I have like this beautiful character designs in front of me. What are you aiming for? What is like what you're saying? Okay, when I start drawing, for example, now a dragon and I see different kind mm -hmm. of characters, I see different kind of uh, uh, shape, sizes, uh, 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 identities actually in a dragon. What are you aiming mm -hmm. for? When, it's, when do you think it's a good character design, considering yourself within your own measurements? Uh, for that, yeah. I, most, most, of the, most of the time I'm, I do that. Like I just do uh, like, a, like pages of explorations based on head sizes, 
uh, variations, you know, moving eyes closer, farther, you know, shape of horns, noses. I do that for, for humans, the features. I move features around, and I'm just trying to find out, you know, what, what looks appealing, what looks interesting, what looks different, what has some character behind it. So I do a lot of that. You know, I'll do uh, a page based on three-quarter shots or maybe a lot of profile shots where, you know, everything's just sideways, and I'll play with the features of the nose, the brow, and stuff. And for me, it's like there's no attachment. I'm just like letting – I'm just like seeing what looks good. And then after a while, if, if there's like a few that look good, then I'll probably go further, and then I'll start doing like acting or like, you know, see what performance I can get out of them. But for that, that's just a lot of exploration. And, there's, and for me, it's like, well, you know, it's, I don't know what it is yet. So I'm just kind of like, you know, moving it until I do. <laughs> hey, and, and when you would, should pick like one of the most interesting one of these four, what, what, which one would you pick then? Over what, if you say, okay, if I would tell a story and I can only pick one character, which, which mm -hmm. character would you choose to, to pull the story off? I think for, like, for example, for this page, I would probably base it on kind of like what I was figuring out as far as personality. Like the upper right, the big guy, the big, mm -hmm. big hulking guy, he looks more aggressive. You know, he looks like he could be like a bully or uh, the bad guy. So, you know, he's kind of has this kind of towering, menacing look where he's probably looking down at people and his size wise, he's huge. So he would be, you know, if I was to kind of go further onto like putting little story moments behind this, he would be like the more the aggressive guy. The other ones seem to be more passive, and you can see like they're kind of cowering. Uh, you know, the the bottom the bottom uh, left looks like a turtle. You know, he kind of looks like you know he's got you know he's just got nothing to say. He just goes about whatever. Uh, the guy on the on the lower right looks kind of scheming. You know, perhaps, but the one on the upper upper left, you know, he looks more like he's scared to make a move. Maybe he's going to be reacting to things and kind of maybe a scaredy cat, perhaps. I don't know. I'm just kind of, you know, that would be my initial take if I was to look at these and like, okay, if I was to move forward on a, on a story moment or a composition, then I would like look at their personalities or I would try and figure out personalities. I would try and like figure out like profiles, like, okay, that guy looks like he would do this. That one looks like he would react like that. And then I would just take little stabs and like thumbnails and, you know, and then see if anything develops. Maybe I would kind of say like, okay, put a situation like, okay, the big guy, uh, you know, he just got something stolen and he's, uh, or no, he's not stolen. Maybe he's, he's, he's hungry and he can't find any food. So he comes across this little guy and he's trying to maybe steal food or, you know, taking the food. So then I have a situation where I can have these guys respond. All right. Oh yeah. And I saw also this picture and there's like some character design. And of course there's also a cat involved. We're going to speak about that a little bit later. Um, and then also you try to, if you have like this character, you imagine what kind of vehicles he would use, what kind of world building. Do you always, when you draw, do you have in the back of your mind where he lives, where, what kind of vehicles he would use, etc., when designing it? Uh, yes and no. Sometimes I do. Like sometimes I'll, you know, before I start drawing, I'll think of something and I'm like, oh, it would be cool if, you know, he or she did this or was driving that. Or, I mean, sometimes that happens. But a lot of times I start with, you know, when I sketch, it kind of, you know, the sketch kind of takes me somewhere and I just kind of go with it. And uh, a lot of it is just comes with like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if, or wouldn't it be funny if that? And then, and then sometimes that might lead into like a situation like, oh, they would meet this person. Or maybe as they're, as they're flying in this thing, they fly to this. So I'm kind of introducing what ifs. I'm introducing possible things that they might see, interact, encounter. Uh, you know, discover that kind of thing. So it's it's just a no. Sometimes I'll have a specific thing in mind. Uh, a lot of times I don't. I'm just kind of drawing for fun. And then it's it's when I'm not really thinking too much is when I kind of add a scenario in, maybe intentionally or not intentionally, and then I kind of see what happens after that. All right. Hey, then I stumble upon these drawing, uh, and I was wondering what can you tell me what you were looking for in this character design? What was your challenge for yourself in this one? Yeah, at the time I heard that um, I think Lucasfilm, uh, they were going to do a Chewbacca film. And I was like, oh, that would be kind of cool. And I'm like, well, how would that look? So this is like a personal challenge. Like, okay, what if what if there was a like a world of Chewbacca's, but 
you know, it'd be it'd be kind of weird that all the Chewbaccas would look the same. So I'm thinking, like, just like any other movie, there'd be a range of characters, uh, a range of of older, younger Chewbaccas. There'd be thinner, fatter. You know, maybe some have a certain skill set or whatever. Anyway, I was just I was just playing around and just kind of, you know, that was a challenge. That was a design challenge. Like, okay, I know who Chewbacca is, but like, how far can I push that range of what I know? So that way there's other personalities and other variations of, of that same character. So that's, I was just having fun with that. I, w I, was, I was really wondering and interesting how they would, how it would sound like if we, we were like a Chewbacca world, the dialogue, a city full of Chewbaccas. How would that sound like? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then I, then I stum stumbled upon these, these little vehicle drawings, of course, that you made. Uh, and even though in a vehicle there is like some character in it as well. So it, it's called, of course, like anthropomorphism. You try to give them some features that look human or recognizable, etc. How do you deal with these kind of drawings? Are you approaching them as well as a kind of a character? Uh, I am. For, the, for that page, that was done for the Angry Birds movie. So, you know, we were, the, the assignment was doing vehicles based on, on that world that they're in. So for, pig, for the Pig Island, these are all based on vehicles for the pig. You know, we had certain rules or there was a universe that was already existing that we were trying to expand on. So for the pig world, everything is based on kind of like uh, man-made items. So everything is either built uh, or, or put together by these materials like wood, steel, uh, bolts, uh, spring bo springs, and so forth. So that was, the tools, that was the toolkit that we had to work with based on that universe we were working in. And then we were like, okay, what would the pigs do as far as vehicles? So we were just kind of, knowing that, we were just kind of take stabs at what that would be. So a lot of these had functional things that we had to consider, like, you know, they had to carry certain things or they had a, they had a, a clutching arm or, or some kind of, you know, they had to carry stuff, collect stuff. And then a lot of times we were like, well, it would be nice if we kind of pushed up the proportions so there were pig-like features maybe in the front, like maybe the grill had protruding or very large openings so it looked like a snout. Or maybe the headlights looked like, you know, eyes for a pig face and so forth so it's a combination of like okay we had to play within this universe based on the uh the technology but then the while it had to be playful whimsical um you know made for these pigs and have fun with that so uh yeah you know we did that for for rovio for for the angry birds movie and that was fun i mean that was one of the one of my best uh, experiences working on a film all right. Hey, and then I would love to discuss a little bit about Coco. Uh, you, you did also some sketches on Coco. And what was what was what you think was so challenging for you uh, regarding Coco? Or what was like struck you in the film and in the script? Yeah, I mean, working with Coco was awesome. I mean, I worked. It was a great story. Uh, Lee Unkrich had this uh, wonderful story. The story had changed when I was on it. So when I saw Coco at the end, it was different than without the, then the story that I was working on, but I was like, just like everybody else, I was just so surprised and overwhelmed by the story and moved. And I cried three times. It was awesome. And I was working with an awesome team, uh, Danny Ariaga, Zar, uh, Gustain, uh, Nat McLaughlin, uh, Jason Merck. Uh, let's see. I hope I don't forget any others, but we, we were all kind of in the early on, we were kind of, we had like, we were brought on as like a, the art team and we had a direct, we had directives and the directives was we're building this, uh, the, this world of, of, uh, of skeletons of the dead based on this very, uh, important specific and very popular holiday in Mexico, the, you know, day of the dead. So we had like five directives that I recall. The five directives was, these, uh, these, this is a movie made about skeletons and humans, but for the skeletons, they can't be scary. We have to try and figure out how to make them emote, how to make them feel and perform. Uh, we had to figure out uh, both sexes, male and female. We also had to figure out if they wear clothes, uh, you know, and how would they wear clothes? And also, would they be wearing the clothes that they died in? That's something we had to like, you know, would that, is that a consideration? And then the other thing, the last thing, the most toughest thing is like, they had to be original. So at this time, uh, you know, the uh, the Book of Life had come out, just an awesome movie by Jorge Gutierrez, and 
just, you know, his movie had such beautiful character designs. And then before his movie, there was The Corpse Bride, Night Before Christmas. And then there were these other movies that just had really awesome skeletal designs. So for us, we had to, like, make a whole new lineup or just present these characters uh, and not mimic those wonderful designs. So for us, it was just a lot of trial and error and just kind of, you know, see what happens and so forth. So we just did a lot of explorations and the whole team were, I mean, that team was awesome. They were so inspiring. And for me, how I worked, I worked really fast and loose and really small. So I would just do pages and pages of just kind of this kind of exploration. And I would just kind of like play with head shapes, you know, round shapes, uh, you know, small shapes, thin shapes. I would try and find openings in the, you know, I, it wouldn't actually be a round skull. I would try and maybe uh, exaggerate the, the sides of the jaw. Uh, maybe the top part of the skull would be more exaggerated and bigger, maybe a thinner jawline uh, as far as like profile, uh, maybe an overbite, underbite, size of the eyes. I was just kind of just seeing what if, well, you know, how, how far can I push it until it doesn't look like a, like a skull. And the challenge with drawing skulls, I'm sure if anyone's drawn a skull before for life drawing or whatever, is skulls are hard to draw. So there's this thing where you want to make it look like a skull, but if you if you the jawline and the face the front of the face if you make that too long or too wide it starts looking like a monkey so there's that balance like okay how far can you take it so it doesn't look like a skull and you get into monkey world so that's kind of the thing you're considering as well so you know we would i would we would do all that explorations and then all the while i would like you know throw facial hair um you know make them look old make them look young and so forth. So a lot of that was just exploration. And when I was brought on it, I wasn't doing specific characters. Uh, I was, it was more like generic characters. We were just trying to figure out the look or like generic uh, skeletons. And then later on, the team, because uh, I had left early on, the team would then go ahead and do more specific characters based on what was in the film. Hey, and and it, in a way, because it's skeletons, um and they have character, but they all fit in the same world, right? So they have like some common design aspects. Uh, what? How, how did you manage that? Like that they actually don't, don't look like a, like a random uh, a skull, but actually they are part of one family. Yeah, I mean that's. I think that's the challenge of character design. It's like you're trying to make unique characters. They all have uh, different features, but at the same time, it's like, well, how do you unite? How do you unite them? so that they're all in the same universe. So sometimes it might mean repeating features. You know, you're repeating a feature within them. Maybe it's the eyes, maybe it's the brow, the nose, maybe it's, it's, their, it's their form on their torso, maybe the shape of the legs and so forth. Um, it's it's it considerations like that that you want to think about. So you want to like limit yourself to that, but you want to work within that and still kind of get range. And for that to work, it's like, well, you just try it, trial and error. You know, do a lot of studies and sketches, and because I don't know, there's there's no answer book to this, so you just have to like play with it, and then in the after a while, it's more of a gut thing. Like, okay, these all feel like they could be within the same universe. All right. Hey, um, I would like to discuss also like doing background set design, um, storytelling, also by using environments. Um, I was looking at your illustrations and concept art. Um, and there's like a lot of story always in your backgrounds. There's like this use of light, the composition, the layout of everything, the structure, the texturing. It's uh, what is what? What are you always try to aim for in your in, in your set designs? What is your goal? When do you think? Okay, See. now I'm going to hand it out to the art direction. Uh, yeah, I think I think basically, you know, as a set designer, I'm just trying to provide locations and sets where the characters can interact. So a lot of times I'm just trying to fulfill what the story needs are. So the story needs are, um, you know, this, this character has to work or live in a certain area. And I have to, before I even design, I have to like get all that information as far as like, who are these people? What do they do? You know, is this a safe place? Is this a, a dark place? Is this a place of sanctuary? Is this a place where they discover something? So I have to kind of, with all that information, then I have like targets to shoot for. I have like, physical targets, you know, things that I have to address in the room that we have to see. Um, I also have to consider like light sources, like, you know, is there natural light? Is there artificial light? So um, what's the lighting scheme in it? Um, I have to think about the emotional 
I guess, um, needs of the story. Like, you know, again, is this uh, a place of hope? Is this uh, a scary place? Is this a place where someone can feel safe? And knowing what that emotion is, then I have to figure out like, well, how do I address that in the set? Is there a place where, you know, um, that they can find comfort in? Is there something there that they can kind of always go back and look for hope? Like, is there a picture on the wall? Um, if there's a chase scene in there, are there areas for them to find shelter? Um, you know, if there's a fight scene, it's like, okay, well, what's the fight? Is it close? Do they need space? Are there things there that they fight with or props? So all these things, like, you know, these are like gener general things. They're not specific because I'm talking kind of blanket wise as far as what I'm thinking. But these are things I have to consider. And then I just take, I start small. I start with small thumbnails and then I kind of work up to like bigger pieces um, with more de detail and so forth. But I'm just working very simply with like big shapes and just kind of creating a space and then trying to address where these characters, what the, you know, how, they, how they're going to act and react in a room. So a lot of times when I think of a location, I put the characters in them because I have context as far as scale, um, you know, how big the room is to them. Um, you know, a sense of camera. I, and I try and match things to the storyboard. You know, a lot of times I'll have storyboards to work with. So there's a storyboard artist has already, has already uh, figured out what's happening in the room emotionally. There's a story there. And then I'll work with it. Uh, and I try and embellish it. I try and underscore what they're trying to say with design. Uh, if there's any opportunity, I try and add stuff to it. Um, without changing the design, I'm trying to, like, enhance maybe what's happening there emotionally. So... You know, there's a lot of things I'm thinking about there. Um, you know, there's nothing really specific because everything has different specific things I have to con figure out. But these are kind of like the things I'm thinking about when I uh, when I try and figure out a, a set. And how how do you, how important for you is the the usage of light? Because there is, um, of course, we know light as part of theater, so you can actually set like really nice moods with it. Uh, you, it tells a lot about the, the phase of the character is developing um, yeah. and the story. So is that like something that you think about like first or is it like you first do what you just mentioned, the big objects, then you're filling it in and then do the light or do you already have like in mind a little bit for, okay, this is really the focus point. I want to have like clear light spots on this. How do you deal with it? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes I'll have something in mind as far as lighting. Uh, a lot of times as I kind of design the set, I'll kind of change my mind. I'm like, oh, wouldn't it be better or stronger if the light was here um, and so forth. So, yeah, lighting is, you know, especially when I'm doing like these um, pencil drawings, um, it's just kind of like, you know, I could use the side of the pencil and I'm just trying, the lighting kind of helps underscore the emotion. You know, it, first it informs, you know, like maybe like look there, you know, it has a functional need, like I want you to look here. I'm kind of addressing the focal point. But a lot of times the lighting can act as like an emotional cue or prop. So, you know, soft lighting, hard lighting, spotlight lighting. Um, along with the lighting, I have to think about the shadows. Are things well lit? Is there a soft shadowing or are there hard, crisp, you know, cutouts as far as like a graphic stuff? So the, the, the lighting part um, really helps kind of underscore the emotion, you know, the tone, what, what, what's happening uh, emotionally. Yeah, and even though this is this drawing that I'm now showing, it has like quite a lot of details. So you, you see like leaves, and you see all kind of materials and tires and and uh, and, and text and etc. So how how you make sure it's all about communication. So how uh, how do you design this in a way that I still understand what you're trying to tell? Because when I look to earlier work of, for instance, students that are just starting, it's much too yeah. much information, but you can't the readability disappears. So how yeah. are you assuring that it keeps readable? What are like some tricks that you are using? I think when I design the set, I try and do it as simple as possible, you know, simple forms, simple shapes. And I'm trying to figure out, I guess the first thing I think about is focal point. Like where, I'm, where what's happening in the set? What's the important thing in the set? It's usually where the hero is or the character. So a lot of times as I'm addressing things in the room, I'm going to try and subtly or indirectly guide the eye to that focal point. So it might be placing the character on the thirds, or there's certain, there's certain things in the room that are indirectly guiding your eye toward that. I might have things in the foreground. 
so that way they kind of frame or vignette the frame, but your eye goes past them. They don't obstruct the focal point, but they kind of, you know, act as like a frame so that way you go towards it. So um, a lot of times it's like placement of the objects. Um, it's important that you don't put like equal or high detail everywhere. You don't really need detail. I think everywhere you need detail pretty much where you want the eye to go. You know, if everything had an equal amount of detail, your eye would like float all over the page and it would be hard for your eye to rest on where you want it to be. So a lot of times you can have, um, usually where, where the eye rests is usually where there's a little more attention to detail, you know, crisper lines perhaps, or uh, there's more, um, there's more, uh, there's more light and dark contrast there. Everything else can spill off. The de details can get softer. Because your eye will kind of feel it, but it won't rest on it. So it kind of, you know, you, it's kind of, you're, you know, it's kind of like these these levers where, you know, high contrast of light and dark is usually where the eye goes. So that's kind of a thing that I consider when I'm doing my lighting, uh, and then also the 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 detail of line. You know, sometimes things that are up close, you want to because they're up close, you can see more detail, but they not maybe that not. That may not necessarily be the case all the time. You just need something, a shape there, or you need some kind of information that, okay, you read it, but you go past it. You're not going to sit there. There's other things to see, um, you know, because your eye kind of has a hierarchy of information that it's trying to figure out. So um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, try and draw simply. And I always consider the focal point as kind of like where I want the eye to land. Do you, and then do you, do you what? So do you look a lot also for live action films, like for big yeah. classic movies or like, because they have the same problem with set dressing. So do you learn a lot also yeah. by watching those kind of films? Yeah, I do. I mean, I look, I'll look at like reference for other films. I'll look at like cinematographers. Uh, there's a place I like to look at like shotdeck.com is, um, it's like a directory of, of screen grabs from different films. And I'll look at them for inspiration. You know, I'll see like, oh, what, what, you know, what, what's the light doing here? Is there soft light, hard light? You know, where's their focal point going? So I'm always looking at stuff for like inspiration. I also look at photography. You know, I look at different photographers to see how they control lighting and, you know, how, you know, how they control a focal point. So I'm always looking for inspiration. And then I also look at other artists too. So, you know, like other what production designers, art directors, sketch artists have done. You know, I'm always kind of like you know, trying to get inspired. So, I, you know, I'll look at everywhere for that as far as like, you know, where I can get it. Any you know, favorites? It could be current. Any favorite? What kind Any of film would you say, okay, like set dressing, that's, that's the film you should watch. This is like uh, when you were talking about like environmental storytelling and how they use the, uh, the overall settings. What kind of movie yeah. is for you really inspiring? Um... It's funny. I mean, there's a lot. I like Roger Deakins. Roger Deakins, uh, director of photography. I mean, any movie he's in is great because he has a great understanding of, of of lighting and how things can spill off and on. And everything doesn't necessarily have to be so crisp. He's just got this, you know, if you look at a lot of his movies, a lot of them are just very soft outlines, but then the light just kind of goes where it needs to be. And it's just very subtle and beautiful. So he's one I look at. Uh, as far as movies, I mean, uh, gosh, it's I know, right. I I know about it's a, lot a of really, it's a broad different. question, but I'm really eager that you say, okay, man, damn, I would have made that. <laughs> yeah, I wish I made that. I wish, like, oh, I wish I would have done that. But yeah, I mean, there's just, there's a lot. I mean, as I go, I'm always looking at older movies and current movies, but I, I also look at direct uh, documentaries. I'm always kind of like looking at what people do. I even look at old TV shows because they were limited to what they could do, but I try and see what, how they did it as far as like, okay, what to, they, they only had a limited tool set or the camera could only move so much, or they probably, you know, didn't have a lot of money. So it's like they had to light something a certain way. So I'm always kind of like looking at like, well, how do they do it? And how do they still make it work? So, you know, it's, it's I guess what it, what I'm trying to say is they don't really need fancy stuff or the most expensive stuff. They just have to be creative and open and try and make it work as best you can. 
right? So I, I, I try to bring from character design, like, like reference material to character design, to like set building, Coco, uh, um, uh, environmental storytelling. I'm now bringing it more to storyboarding because that's also uh, telling the story in a visual way. Um, you get a script, of course, and then you read like parts of the script. Um, how does it work for you from, from then on? So uh, how do you start off? How does it work visualizing a, uh, a script? Yeah, I think, I think just like everyone else, when you read a script, you're already getting like these, these mental visual images of what you're thinking you're, you're going to see or plot. So a lot of it is just blocking out visually, maybe in one shot, what this v first image would be like. You know, usually when you read a script, they'll have descriptions. You know, you'll say like, oh, you're entering in this room and this room is in downtown and it's dark and you're in it's a hotel and it's a dirty hotel and, and stuff like that. So right away, that information, I'm creating a, pen, a mental image and then I'm trying to think like, okay, what, what, that, what would that look like? And it could be like based on stuff I've seen, either from a movie or personal experience. So I'm just trying to get an idea of what that could be. And then... Once I have that, I'll just usually block in like a few images of what that might be. And I kind of like be bored or I'm trying to like just in the most shortest way, get an idea of the visuals. And then later on, I'll just kind of take the next phase where I'll just kind of like, OK, I'll figure out what the action is or I'll just kind of plot like what's happening in here. Do I have to consider space or, you know, are they did they start here and do they end here? Um, you know, if it's a quiet moment, as far as there's not a lot of action, but there's like maybe there's a lot of emotional, you know, subtle acting, you know, someone's exposing news or there's a revelation or something, then I have to think about uh, it's more the performance. So I'm thinking about the performance. Uh, so I have to like figure out, you know, what are they reacting to? You know, it's in the script, but then I have to like interpret what that script is. And then I have to try and hit those beats. I have to hit that emotion. I have to hit whatever the writer, the director wants me to hit. And a lot of times it's a lot of like exploration, you know, trial and error. What's, what's the best way? What do, you, what do I think is the strongest way to kind of get that emotion? You know, yeah, I have to maybe consider contrast. Yeah, because I, I see like a lot of people who are doing like boards or like doing their graduation films. I, as you know, I'm a teacher. Um, you can do it like all the shots, you can do it in a thousand ways, right? You can do it in so many different ways, different camera angles, different kind of lighting different kind of layout, et cetera, et cetera. So how are you margining down all the options? Do you think about like all the scenarios or is you really that you say, okay, this is the beat, like there's like this hijack kind of situation or this is like a certain kind of tension that I'm building up. So I start with a close, blah, 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 dark. So you also already try to think of it as a beat, as almost as, as a moving storyboard when you're plotting things out. I do. Sometimes I approach it different ways. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll do like a like location scouting. So what I'll do is if I know everything is happening in a certain set, like there's a set that's already designed, then what I'll do is for fun before I, um, or maybe maybe before or after I read the script, I'll just move the camera around and I'll figure out like, okay, this is what it's going to look like from here and there and here. And I'll just do like these little thumbnails and I'll just kind of like, then I, then I have an idea of what the room is going to look like if I move the camera. And then from there, I can start boarding and I can kind of cut and paste or grab or draw information from those thumbnails. Um, or I could just kind of like keep things very simple. And, and this is what I see a lot of students do. They go a little crazy when they do the storyboard because they feel like, oh, I have to move the camera around and I have to create a lot of shots. But I always tell people, just keep things simple. You know, if you keep things uh, maybe at eye level and you kind of create just a wide shot where you just have to inform in the wide shot where we're at, how far characters are at. And then from there, you can cut in, and you can cut in either um, you know, in a side view or better yet, an over-the-shoulder shot of whoever your players are. The over-the-shoulder shots offer a more point of view. You, know, you offer uh, a vantage point from one of your characters. So from there, you can cut back and forth. If you can cut wide and then over-the-shoulder one character, over-the-shoulder the other, and intercut between the two, that's all you really need as far as like simple economic camera storyboarding. Um, it's kind of, I call it the I Love Lucy kind of storyboarding. If you ever see an I Love Lucy episode um, from the uh, late 50s, early 60s, 
Everything is very economic, but it's very uh, functional. You know, it works. If the story needs it, then you can start being more creative with what the camera can do. If uh, you know, you can have, you know, you can offer a handheld. Like if you have to, if it feels stronger where the story needs a more intimate, specific point of view of a character walking, then it's almost like, well, what would that look like? So it's once POV as they're going down or maybe looking around the corner to look at something. Um, a lot of times, you know, you may want to tilt the camera up or down if you really need to see stuff above or below us. Or maybe you want to consider pans or any kind of like camera moves to either motivate the camera. Like if someone turns, we're kind of suggesting we're going with them and looking at what they're looking at uh, and so forth. It's all these things you're kind of considering. And, uh, and just, I guess, for, for students out there, you don't really have to be crazy with the camera. I think just keep things simple, eye level, and then always consider the points of view of your characters. You know, over the shoulders uh, are effective. And you don't have to, you know, you can always, it's nice to reuse the same shot. When you do it over the shoulder, you don't have to like move the, the camera over the shoulder all the time. You can just lock it and just kind of reuse that. And that way, because anytime you move the camera, the audience has to uh, reorient themselves as to what they're seeing. It's like, oh, that's new information. So I have to take a moment to figure that out. Okay, now I can go back into the story. So it's, it's these things you want to consider. Just keep things simple and only show something new or only go to a certain angle if, it really, if, it, if you think it really needs to bring in more information or it cues up more emotion, an emotional element that you really need. A lot of these things, I mean, it's funny. There's no answer book to this. Uh, a lot of these are just kind of like these broad suggestions as far as how to work. My uh, suggestion for young students and maybe older students uh, is for start looking at scenes yeah. and films. Or for, or for everybody, start looking at scenes and films. You know, start looking. Not If you have time to look at movies, that's great. But a lot of people don't have the time. So look at scenes in a movie and look at how a scene starts. Look at how it ends. Each scene in a movie is a mini movie within a big movie. And every scene, there's a reason that scene is in the movie because there's either a bit of information or there's an emotional element that the director wanted you to have or take that fulfills the, the whole story. So when you see the movie, try and figure out what that is. See what the choices are that the director made or the cinematographer. All, all, these, all these folks, they're trying to say something there. So you want to see what is it they're trying to say. And when you see a scene, look at the scene for enjoyment, see what's happening. As you're watching the scene, ask yourself, what are you feeling? Or what, what information did you get? And those are, the, those, those are the cues you want to try and figure out because then you can dissect that information and figure out like, well, was it the lighting? Was it the pacing of the scene? Was it the intercutting? Was it the camera angle? You'll notice that maybe they started with just economic storytelling, three camera setups. And then eventually when something, maybe there was a high point where they had new information or a new element, maybe the editing got faster or maybe they went to a new angle. I don't know, but it's like, it's studying, it's studying film and you're studying these choices that the director made, the filmmaker made, and they're all telling a story, but they're trying to punch like an emotion to you or, or information. They're trying to get you into something. And that, that's a way of learning, you know, study that and just trying to figure out what that is. All right. Yeah. I'm, I'm showing a few examples of your explorations of how to tell things and going from one scene and the other scene and how it works. It's really nice, like these kind of sketches, you're really exploring the best possible way in how to tell this, right? Because in the end, and that's the thing with animation, it's show, not tell. Uh, it, it's sometimes yeah. different than live action because it's like you can have like voiceovers. Of course, that's also possible in animation, but like how to visualize something that all should be designed. It's uh, it's quite a, quite a challenge. And I really like yeah. this kind of... Uh, explorations to, to say mm. like this also how you use like yeah. this dark and i almost if i watch this it's almost like you you can imagine how it will look like in the film right yeah i'm just trying to like figure out like oh you know what would it what would that be what would it look like what how how close can i get it to kind of i'm trying to like you know i'm, I'm visualizing in my mind it's like well how can i get it as close as, as i can to what it would be in the film so these are just explorations. I'm just kind of moving the camera around. For, for this, this is like a personal story I had. I had just watched Lord of the Rings and I was really inspired by it. And so I was thinking like, okay, this little Hobbit type character, 
could be lurking in and about, and then he sees other characters, uh, monsters, creatures, and so forth. So I would, this is more of a, I was just playing around with what the design would look like, but like, you know, what would this little Hobbit character see or encounter? So, you know, I was just kind of moving the camera around and just having fun exploring. The bottom right, you know, they're not in there, but I'm just exploring what a set might look like. But I also, what I like in these kind of setups, it's, it's like this, this almost you look with your main character, you look into that cave or this, this, this trunk in the darkness and then the eyes, but then he comes up really clicking. And then you see this like this nice little landscape and you can almost imagine the yell that goes through, through, that, through that canyon over there. So it really uh -huh. works also as a beat in that sense. You can, and I think that's really clever. And what you're mentioning is true. I think also from a student perspective or for people who are just starting making films or like exploring the possibilities, if you can't yeah. tell a story economic, you also can't tell it really detailed, right? So in that sense where you yeah. can do, you can use like a lot of different kind of strange camera action and angles and you can put like a lot of details in it. But if it doesn't work in the core of the storytelling, you can put like a yeah. lot of visual effects on top of it and you can just try to muffle it away. If I don't know if you say it like this or just like, but if it doesn't work in that essence of storytelling, it doesn't work, right? Exactly. I mean, I think a lot of stuff on there and they're forcing something and it's like, it's just, you know, it's like, it's like icing and cake. It's like the cake is the foundation. It's like the, the, the basic, what, what the construction of what it is. Icing is just all the sexy stuff on top of it. So you don't really need the icing if you have good cake. So um, I think just kind of, I, I tell, I tell students like, if you can make a stick figure, like a little story, a story situation with a stick figure, not a lot of detail. All you need is eyes and the head of the shape and a mouth and just his body. If you can make that stick figure act and perform in a situation and we can go with them, you've done your job. So any, anything else on top of that character, like if you kind of put a model or costuming or you, anything, the story still holds up, but now, you know, it's more of a design thing. So it's like, it's not a lot about the sexy, what they're wearing. It's more like the construction. It's like, what's this character doing and feeling and so forth. So that, that, that goes into storyboarding and storytelling. You know, you can swap out the character or the, or the look and design, but it's like, it's more like an emotional thing. It's like, can we, do we know what the character is feeling, doing, acting, you know, introduction of a scene, they come in, maybe they react to something and then you figure out what they, he or she needs to do or, or, or escape from, you know, it's these, that's, that's all you need. That's like basic situation. It's not, it's not about the drawing or anything on top of the drawing or the design. It's kind of like, you know, these basic, these basic stick figures are like the souls that you're working with. They're like the initial souls that you're trying to create a story with. So, um, yeah, so I just, you know, think in terms like that. It's not about, you know, you can put as many crap on top of the design. That's gonna help the story. It's like, don't worry about, don't worry about the design. Focus on the story. You know, compose your composition with a, with a, with a stick figure. Um, you know, and, and if you can make me, if you can make me feel or react with the stick figure, job done. Yeah. Did you ever saw the films of Love Sport from Studio AKA? You should check them out. They only make films with just one pixel. So just like blocks. And mm. uh, you actually yeah. feel when something happens to that just simple block figure, it actually hurts. Yeah. So it hurts so much. So you actually, you learn like what kind of movement interaction is needed to actually get in involved with a simple cube. And uh, if you can't yeah. handle that kind of basics, the rest will be like really challenging for you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're now going to like some, some projects. You, you did some boards for, for also for Spider-Man. What, what, how did, what was your experience working on that part? That was awesome. That was wonderful. I was only there for, I think, it wasn't long. I think it was two months at the most, maybe, maybe a little more. But uh, I worked on three sequences. They eventually changed, but I, I started working on these three sequences. And it was great. It was an awesome experience, you know, working with the directors and, and just, you know, all the designers and, and, and the other story guys. They were, you know, it was, it was awesome. I, 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 didn't really under, I, I didn't realize what would come of it, you know, how, how good the film would look like, how original it would look like it would be. 
it was that was awesome. Hey, and are, um, are you just then picked for doing one of two scenes? How does that work exactly? I, I, I don't imagine you're asked to do to solve a problem that for this film, or you get like a few scenes, or how did you got involved? What was the question? <laughs> I mean, how I got involved, I think at the time I was working on the Emoji movie at Sony, and then uh, I think I just rolled off, and then there was a need uh, that they needed story work, or they needed a story person on, on, on the Spider-Verse. So they asked me if I'd be interested, and I said, sure. And that's how I got on. And uh, I remember seeing all this beautiful artwork. You know, it's, it's very much the artwork you'd see in the art of books and, and floating around. And I thought it was beautiful. And my first, my first thought was like, how is that going to animate? Because you had all this beautiful kind of graphic kind of take on it, which was beautiful. But I was like, at the same time, it's like, well, how is this going to move? How does a character go in in that? So I remember, they, I remember they told us, it's like, oh, don't worry about that. We're trying to, you know, they're going to they're gonna try and figure that out. But they said, just kind of bored as you always would. You know, it's more getting the emotion and just, you know, letting the characters kind of act and feel as you would in any story situation. So, you know, we just kind of storyboard and I was just blown away by how they made that technology work. So, yeah. And then I, they would just give us a sequence, you know, it's kind of like, okay, here's the sequence. You know, they give you a script. The script would be like, um, you know, it could be anywhere between like a page and a half to maybe four or five pages. And then you would just take the sequence and then you would, you know, take, it would go back and forth. You take stabs at it until you kind of get something that they kind of felt happy with or it was strong enough to, to move forward on. You already mentioned a few names like like Emoji and uh, and the Spider Man. You also work like on some of the I iconic films like Cars. Um, uh, is it is I, I, we in the Netherlands? We always watch like on on Pixar. It's it's quite. Was it also difficult for you to get involved in these kind of films? Are you are you sending like reels, drawings? How get, do you get involved in these kind of projects? Mm. Well, for this, I mean, usually for any film. To get involved, I guess what I'm trying to say is when you're a visual development artist for the industry, you don't really have a choice as far as what you want to work on. A lot of times you just have to work with what's given to you. So, and that's, that's the role of a visual development artist. We don't have a choice. I, I guess 98% of the time, there's like a 2% chance that it's positive, but 98% 90, of the time, you don't have a choice. You know, it's like this falls on your lap and you have to accept the challenge and you try and figure it out. Um, the 2% is like, if you're lucky enough and you, you enjoy what that is and you draw it, that's fine. For cars, uh, I wasn't a car guy. I had no idea what, you know, about the parts of a car, you know, how to work a car. All I know is how to drive and put gas in it. That's all I know. So when we started this film, um, you know, as a designer, there was two things I had to consider. There was the story part, which later on I had to figure out the design of, like, you know, the location and so forth. But there's also this thing in the design where this is a world made by and made by and for cars. So a lot of things had car parts. So I had to like inform myself on the cars world, you know, car parts. Uh, I had to figure out like, how do we make a building out of car parts? And, um, and then as we moved forward, there was these little rules, like for every country we went, we had to use the car parts or the cars in that country. So if we went to Italy, we had to use Italian cars. Uh, if we went to London, we had a, or or England, we had to use English cars and so forth. And there was these. Um, I remember as you're designing these cars, we had little rules like from far away, it should look like a real building, and the closer you got, you can then see the car part. And that was just kind of a general rule that they had because you didn't want to make it look too cartoony from far away. Then it would start looking like an amusement park. It would start looking like Disneyland, you know, things, things would be too iconic and, and the silhouettes would kind of call attention to themselves. So, you know, those are these rules we had to think about as we designed. So it's like we had to inform ourselves on the cars world. And then we just kind of, as a designer, approach the needs of what the, of what the story wanted, you know, like, oh, there's a racetrack or this is a garage. And then, you know, we had to figure out what's in the garage, what's happening in the garage, you know, and stuff like that. There was a lot. You know, I just, I just kind of threw all that out there. But yeah, that's just all that stuff you have to consider. Also worked on Monsters, Monster University. Um, mm -hmm. um, what was your biggest challenge in designing elements for this picture? 
Uh, I think the challenge was that there was already an existing movie ahead of us. There was Monsters Incorporated, beautiful movie. The world was already designed and so forth. So f the challenge was we had to continue that design, but in a university setting. And so we had to expand the, the design of that world. So a lot of it was, what was great, what, what it, there was like pros and cons. The pros were like, okay, we already had something set there. The cons were we had to expand stuff and we had to make sure that we still fulfilled uh, the rules of, of that universe and did, did, it, did it make sense? Was it still made from that same hand? So that was a challenge. This is also a beautiful uh, set. There's so much details in this one. I can't, how, how long does it take actually to create such a piece for you? Do you work one day on this, two days, three days? No, no, this was like, I think at least two or three weeks. Uh, and this was, uh, yeah, this was the, uh, the Uzma Kappa living room. This is what, this is uh, a Squishy's mom's house that they made into the fraternity. So I remember working on this, uh, I think, as I was working on this, um, I was I was working on Maya, so we were kind of had I was like trying to use Maya as far as like blocking out the room, and then once I had a sense of space, then I just drew over it, and then the direction behind this was it had to look like an old lady's home, but and so there's there's a lot of elements there that said old lady, so basically you know the what do you call it the uh, the hutch the grand the grandfather clock. The, the the dishes the the chimney the, the the furniture and so forth. I remember we they wanted us to look at the um, All in the Family, which is a, a a show that was in the 1970s in the U.S. So uh, that was set in New York. I think in if I'm not mistaken, I think it's Flushing, New York. I could be wrong, but it, uh, the house was it, it it was a good example where it was an older it was an older couple who lived in the 50s. And then the show was set in the 70s, but it looked like nothing aged. Like it, it was like set in time. So that was a great inspiration as far as like getting that feel, that vibe, that look. So we looked at a lot of older ladies' homes and stuff like that. And then we were just kind of dressing up. And then we had to monsterify it. So that way we had to make sure this world this this lived in the monster world. So part of the monster design was we would try and add uh, little elements as far as like fangs, teeth. Um, eyes, uh, hidden faces, and so forth. So there's a balance here, but all the while it's like, okay, it should look like an old lady. So, and I should I should call out um, the characters in that set. Those were done by Dice uh, Dice Sumi, and he's he's awesome. So I just threw his characters in, and uh, I was working with Dice and Robert Kondo. Those guys were awesome. They they were the set designers and color designers for the movie, and uh, yeah, it was a great it was a great experience. And this was actually uh, uh, Terry and Terry, the the twins. Uh, there was they were gonna have a bedroom in the movie, and then unfortunately it got cut. But this was one of the assignments where we had to design a bedroom that still had like this split kind of uh, uh, feel, where you know one of them was tidy and one was messy. So uh, that was fun to think and, and figure out. Hey, and, and working in the industry, it's like a lot of questions asked about it, like, is there a lot of competition? Do you have the feeling or the, like insecurity in this that, oh, I hope they want to take me for this job or oh, does, does the work come in, etc. How do you deal with that kind of competition, kind of stress or like can it deliver what the art director is demanding for uh, because you have to do like a lot of drawings, you have to, you have to be creative all the time. Um, yeah. How how did that influence you, or how do you deal with this? Yeah, well, there's a lot of competition. I I think there's always competition when you kind of are working in in a in an industry that has talent, because there's always you know it's all about making the best that you can. So you're you're working with a lot of artists and designers, creative people who are rising up to the occasion. They're gaming up, so they're coming up and they're you know they're coming up all you know full steam with. The, the best thing they can provide. So there's always this competition. And um, and yeah, that can be pretty stressful. That can be daunting because it's like, you always realize there's always someone better than you. So, but that can be a good thing because it makes you humble. So um, in a good way, it's like, it's not about like, you know, 
I'm, I'm always good. No, if you're hung, if you're humble, it kind of keeps you staying hungry. So you always have to like st keep working harder. You have to always keep getting better at your craft and so forth. So yeah, there is competition in this industry, but don't let that bother you. Just realize like that's part of the, the job and it just kind of comes with it. And so what you want to do is like, okay, knowing that you just want to just try and do the best you can. Um, you always want to try and do the best you can, but do the best you can without stressing yourself. You know, you never want to take this job personal where, you know, it's like, oh, they don't like my work and they must not like me and so forth. It's like, no, when you work in this industry, we don't know, we don't have all the answers. We don't have an answer book. We don't like, you know, we don't like shoot it out of our pocket. It's like, we have to find it. We have, you know, it evolves. So you have to condition yourself that you're a problem solver. And when you come into any kind of assignment or role, you have to, you're coming in blind. And then you get your direction, and then you're kind of molding your design to what is needed for the story. And that goes for anybody. I mean, I've been doing this for more than 20 years, and every Monday when I get a new assignment or whatever, I don't know what it is. I have to try and figure it out. So what happens is, you know, that can be stressful if you don't know what it is. But then it's all about the same thing. How do you figure it out? Well, you go through the same process. What happens is you try and figure out what, what's the design, what are the needs of the design? What's the story? You know, it's all these, it's, it's this checklist of questions and information you want to know before you design. You know, you, you don't want to go in blind. You have a, you have a, what do you call it? A target you have to hit. So what happens is uh, usually, ideally on your launch, when you talk to your director or art director, that's when you get all the information. But if there's things there that you don't have, it's up to you to ask, you know, because you know, sometimes the story may not be completely there, or they may they may have forgotten to tell you what it is. So what you want to do is you want to try and get all the information you can. Then you get reference. Before you do any kind of artwork, you should always get reference. You want to inform yourself of, of what this world is, um, specifically maybe what this location is that you're going to do. If there's any other things, you know, if this takes place in a in a different country, get to know a little more of what that is. And then once you have, once you're comfortable and familiar with that, then you can start designing. But always design small, small thumbnails. Don't go to full on like I'm going to put all this crap in detail and impress them and, and 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 overwhelm them with my design. No, no, no. That's that's not the way to work. What you want to do is you want to work small and simple, and you want to uh, you want to create this uh, communication, this back and forth. You want to like you know in the first review show them your ideas, your reference, and that way. They can say, yeah, I like the direction. Yeah, I like this reference. I don't like this reference. This way, as you go through each of the phases, you can kind of hit closer targets to try and get what you need. Later on, once you have more information as far as what you need and what you have to hit, then you can put more love and detail into your painting. That's working efficiently. You know, you're always working smart, but you want to work efficiently because you only have a small window to work in. So you want to work smart. You don't want to kill yourself. I know a lot of people, a lot of young guns, a lot of young artists are like, oh, you know, I'm going to work 14 hours on this, on this, on this one drawing to impress them. I want to prove myself. And it's like, well, yeah, I get it. But why are you doing that? Then, you know, first of all, they're only paying you for eight hours. So you should only do eight hours work. Plus, why are you, why are you putting all this information in when you don't know what the design is yet? You know, there's this communication part where you have to figure out what they want before you spend the time and energy to deliver what they need. So um, that's working smart. And, you know, it's easy to kind of, as a young guy, I know you want to prove yourself, but it's like you want to work smart so that way you can deliver what you can without killing yourself and, and so forth. You want to be careful because if you keep working at that high pace, they're going to keep expecting you to work at that high pace. Some people can work at that high pace. But if you're a young guy and then you over, you know, if you work at that high pace, they're going to expect it all the time. And it's like, well, you just kind of sandbagged yourself. You just kind of, you know, killed, killed your, your, your rhythm there. So work smart, work efficiently, um, build up to condition yourself to like getting the information you need and then uh, work small and then learn how to communicate when you do your feedback, you know. Your director, he or she will tell you, oh, I like this, I like that, I don't like this, fine. Take the notes, and then on the next phase, continue and expand based on what they like and add a little more 
and so forth. You're kind of narrowing your target this way. And um, ideally, you're not going to kill yourself or, or overwork yourself. You know, because you're in it for the long run. This is, you know, you've heard this thing where it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. you got to condition yourself and uh, stay healthy. And that's another part. You know, you want to stay healthy physically and mentally through all this, you know, because this can be a stressful job. But it doesn't have to be a stressful job. You know, you just, that's up to you to work on how you want to work. All right. Well, some some creatures who are really efficient and really clever uh, are cats. Uh, I think they are not that much stress, at least not minds. They are like the total uh, embodiment of Buddhism and, and take it easy. Um, you have, what, what is your thing with cats? What, why, why do you like them so much? And uh, Because I, I'm, I'm now going towards a, another project of yours. Uh, so what fascinates yeah, I, you on cats? Yeah. yeah, I mean, to be honest, I have a lot of stuff. A lot of artwork recently has cats in it. To be quite honest, I only did it because it was easy to draw. When I was when I was at Comic Con, I would you know I have my booth and I would be selling my my books or my sketches, and they always wanted like a sketch in the, in the book, and I was like sure uh, I'd be happy to, and I'm like well what can I draw that didn't take so long? I needed to do something like in a, in like 30 seconds or or a minute, and I just did this little cat, and then I just kept doing it because it was easy to draw. But then the more I did it, after a while, I would kind of be on my own time and I'd be like, hmm, you know, there's that cat character again. And I would just, you know, think of situations with the cat. And before you know it, I had like these little things where I could do with the cat. The cat evolved. If you look at my older, older cat drawings, he was a lot more older and fatter and stuff. And then after a while, he became younger and I was trying to get these more innocent feel and looks. And then after a while, I was creating a personality behind them where he was more of a cosplayer and... He was an artist at heart, and you know he would kind of, um, you know, do different things. You know, he would he would take personas as far as like a punker or a superhero or or something. So, uh, and then yeah, I would I would do paintings where I would try and um, these paintings I eventually did print so I could sell them at the Comic Con or Lightbox, where I would kind of like um, you know he was an artist at heart, but he was also a geek and a nerd, and he loved superheroes. So. Uh, with every action movie that came out, I had a personal challenge of like, well, I'm just going to design that cat in that character. So, you know, when Captain America came out, I did, I did a version of him as Captain America. And then same with Black Panther and so forth. So, there, I mean, these were like fun little challenges, but at the same time, I was like, oh, I, I guess I could sell these as prints and so forth. And while I'm doing this, it kind of helped me expand the storyline of this cat. So the cat character is just, uh, a personal project that I'm trying to do on this on this on this uh, character. So yeah, and that's still kind of ongoing. But that's where the cat comes from. And um, I'm not really a cat person. I'm a dog person. So nothing against cats, but you know, I just I like dogs. But we have cats around the house. Uh, we we can't have cats because my daughter is allergic to cats. So we have neighborhood cats from either side that come by. So um, I bought cat food and I feed them so that way they hang out in the backyard. But that's, I mean, that explains, like, hopefully. The But it's, cat a, thing. it's a lot of them. You draw, like, how many did you do? Because I have a few here on the table. Uh, but it's like what I just showed. But you also have like Iron Man and like some mm -hmm. uh, Star Wars editions. How many of these draw did you, did you create? I think I'm up to like 33, 32 or 33. And then there's still more to do because uh, there's stuff I haven't really shown, but I was doing stuff for The Mandalorian. Uh, I was doing more Star Wars. I was doing more on this on new characters that were coming out. And then there's even like shows that weren't really superheroes, like uh, Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec. I had I have a, a, a cat on him, which I haven't shown yet. So, you know, it's basically iconic or pop, pop culture characters that I try and, you know, take a spin doing the cat in. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for this interview, uh, John. I, I really enjoyed it. I know you're really busy with, with always with drawing, with, with projects. So we really, really appreciate your time with us and sharing all your knowledge. It was uh, really insightful. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, thank, you. Be, be, thank you. 
And before we're going to finish it, uh, I also want to ask uh, the, uh, the audience to see you next time. So I hope to see you back then. And I wish you all the safety. Take care. And please inspire each other in these uh, challenging times. Oh, that challenging time. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time. Thank you, John. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Much. Bye -bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye -bye. Bye-bye.